Dr. Ari Mashalkar is a national research professor, which means an all, an all union India a professor with purview across uh, India at large. He has recently been Director General of the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research in India, chair Chairman of its National Innovation Foundation, and also currently the President of the Indian National Science Academy, the Global Research Alliance, and Institute of uh, Chemical Engineers in the UK. He is by training a chemist, a chemical engineer, but he has come a, a long way in terms of uh, dealing with other areas and other disciplines and other subjects. He is essentially a very multidisciplinary man with a command of every subject that he has indeed handled. A recipient of many honorary doctorate, doctorates reflecting his global influence, not only of his person, but of his ideas. Uh, I uh, urge you to look at his biography, which indeed is a recapitulation of the trajectory of innovation in India since independence in many ways. Uh, most recently, he has authored a book. I ordered it the other day, it hasn't arrived. A book titled, and I highly recommend it, I've read summaries of it and reviews of it, from leapfrogging to pole vaulting. Quite a challenge indeed. And to take us on that journey from leapfrogging to pole vaulting, dealing in particular with the challenge of COVID-19, he will be presenting today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor McIntyre. I'm uh, indeed very privileged uh, uh, to be with you. I'm going to talk about how do we respond when we have a major pandemic? How do we create an opportunity out of that adversity? How we have to remember that pandemics will come and go, but it is science which will solve technology that will transform and innovation that will impact. And rather than being at the periphery, therefore, science, technology, and innovation have to come to the center and particularly uh, for a developing country like India, uh, that has been extremely uh, sort of important. So that is my topic, Indian science, technology and innovation. And when uh, uh, this pandemic hit us, what did Indian science, technology and innovation do? And what are the lessons from what we do, what we could have uh, done better as far as the future is concerned? Well, if you look at uh, COVID-19, uh, they call it the black swan event of the century. And one must say that there has been a significant setback for world's ambition to achieve the sustainable development uh, uh, goals, as you can see. Uh, for example, if you look at all these sustainable development goals, one is no poverty. In fact, I will show you later that 100 million people moved from extreme, I mean, poverty to extreme poverty within just 100 days, uh, uh, zero hunger. I mean, if you look at all these indicators, you know, quality education, I will show you how everything has been hit. And in uh, just a few days, uh, whatever we had earned in years has been sort of taken back. Now I've used the word black swan but uh, somebody said, is it black swan or is it a black elephant? You know, we talk about elephant in the room. In a sense, we are aware that uh, there is a challenge, there is a problem, pandemics are threats, like what Economic Forum had done it during uh, the beginning of the decade. Among uh, the risk factors that they had talked about, uh, pandemic was definitely one. Uh, and therefore, did we uh, not... Uh, know that uh, such things will happen and still what did we do? That is the question. So is this a black swan or black elephant? And therefore, uh, when we recognize that the elephant is there, should we not be proactive? That's the first question. The second is, as I said, years of gains eroded in um, uh, days. Biggest job crisis post World War I, 495 million jobs lost globally. Then the fault lines in public healthcare systems were exposed globally, as you can see. Every country uh, sort of suffered from that, and poorer countries in particular. I mean, we have seen right here in India people not getting admitted uh, to hospitals, 
and therefore they are dying without uh, uh, having sort of a, a treatment uh, the number of patients far exceeded the number of beds and so on and so forth 100 million families plummeted to extreme poverty in 100 days from poverty to extreme poverty and as i will show you later what we had gained in several years we lost in few days the worst recession since the great depression of 1930 different countries have been affected to different uh, uh, extent but all countries have been affected uh, global uh, labor income declined by 10.7% 1.6 billion children went out of school 16% of kids their future is at risk they miss mandatory vaccination now if you look at the inequalities how they have been amplified you know 2018 they declined by 1.2% 2019 they declined by 1.5% but in 2020 after pandemic they increase by 7.1% in terms of the poverty all right so if you just see this curve for example uh pre covid situation was such that we would have been coming down like this but if you see uh, the uh, april projection and the june projection uh, 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 and uh, you can see this rising we don't have the latest july and august but it is even uh, sort of more so what we really have is 20 years of progress is gone and covid 19 could push 100 million people into extreme poverty says uh, uh, world bank and this has a big implication because when people are driven into extreme poverty uh, uh, what happens to their children again child labor comes back all right so there are whole range of issues then they don't get educated then their future gets uh, destroyed so therefore this has a very serious uh, consequence now in india we had plenty of challenges by the way while dealing with this and i'm going to take you through each one of uh, these and say what did we do when we had the challenges challenge number 1 was we had limited availability of quality test kits first you know need to know whether uh, you are uh, you are covid positive or covid uh, uh, negative now in april india found itself at the back of uh, Uh, the the this thing as far as the virus uh, test kits uh, uh, were concerned in fact our state run labs were operating at only one third the capacity because we didn't have the kits private lab managed just an average of eight tests a day and the priorities are going to countries that's what i were told uh, were, were told where there is a major outbreak like italy and spain and the us and the uk so all major international vendors were saying at that time that i'm not sure how much i can allot for india so india ran out of uh, time out of kits for example april 12 uh, the headlines were several targets missed still no sign of rapid testing kits you know so we had ordered 500000 kits from chinese suppliers on march 30 and several states were waiting for these kits to arrive and we distributed to them that was the situation on april 12 then april 16 we found that those kits were faulty all right just like so so many others uh, did and on april 21 states were advised not to use the rapid testing kits you can just imagine the situation you are waiting for the kits they arrive then you find them faulty and you are just left helpless that is where we began but what i am proud to say is that our system just rose up uh now our scientific research system has of course universities the indian institute of technologies uh, the national labs like council of scientific industrial research uh, 40 labs i remember heading it for 11 and a half years you know we have 20000 scientists they all rose to the occasion csr did fantastically well as a matter of fact you know uh, within 100 days what they created was absolutely unbelievable but what i'm proud to say and i heard this uh, discussion about incubators and startups and atlanta and the innovation hub so what i'm going to show you is not what the big lab with resources did but what ordinary people the startups were charged actually came and sort of delivered because to me that makes the story so this my lab in pune i live in city of pune actually developed this within 6 weeks in fact they started the work in january as soon as uh, uh, the who uh, said what the genome sequence was because you need to know the genome sequence before you can Uh, create something to test it because you took part of that uh, the, the sort of uh, 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 gene sequence and then identify some uh, specifics 
So on 20th March, they launched the first uh, um, uh, uh, Made in India kit, by the way, just six weeks. And they tested 1.2 million people in three months, the following three months. And in India, you will always find it is affordable excellence. All right. Now, normally you will say, uh, uh, what do you mean by affordable excellence? Uh, affordability and excellence don't go together. What is affordable is not excellent. And what is excellent is not affordable. But that is India's speciality, by the way. We create affordable excellence, 10x, 10 times better, 10 times cheaper. In this particular case, it was three times uh, lower uh, in price. And then 95% components were sourced locally. That's uh, very important because time was running out and we could not uh, basically go for imports. So that's what they did. They created this fellow catch. On, the, on 25 July, they launched their first Made in India antigen testing kit. And the cost was just $7 per test, by the way. Now, what is remarkable in this is that why am I showing you this lady? This lady is the chief technology officer of uh, 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 this uh, uh, my lab. And you know, she was pregnant. She was in the ninth month. And she was about to deliver the uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, baby the baby girl, as it turned out, and uh, she did not move and postpone going to the hospital till she had submitted all the reports. All right. And within four hours after that, uh, she was admitted and she delivered. So there is a human story to that, which I find very, very fascinating. Then Salsit, the other uh, thing, once again, not six weeks, in seven weeks, they were already actually looking at uh, TB, you know, with a mobile app screen. Uh, a patient by looking at the uh, cuff sounds and then you detect whether you have TB or not. So they very quickly repurposed it within, within seven weeks and uh, uh, created one for uh, COVID. So they use the audiometric technology to detect respiratory illnesses via cuff sounds. And they identified the asymptotic cases based on cuff sound signatures and cost per test, by the way, just five cents. That's incredible. For India, that becomes very, very critical. So you can see here that uh, there were 1,000x increase in testing in just 60 days, uh, concerted innovative effort, how Indian ramped up its uh, COVID-19 testing uh, sort of capacity. That was the first challenge. Okay, now we are self-sufficient in uh, sort of case. The second was how to screen the higher risk candidates first in the given population and how to identify future hotspots before they reach that stage. Now, you must have seen, many of you must have that seen Oscar Award winning uh, uh, scheme about uh, uh, the slums in India and the slum dog and so on. Now, this is Dharavi. This is considered as Mumbai's, uh, was considered as Mumbai's ticking time job because you talk about uh, social distancing. Now, how can you have social distancing when in a small room of 12 by 12, you have six people? You can't. And uh, you can just imagine per square kilometer, they had close to 400,000 people, by the way. And this density I just calculated is 255 times the population density of Atlanta. Per square feet, if you see how many people are there. So it was impossible, social distancing. So people had said that this is going to just uh, run a MOOC. It did not. And in fact, Los Angeles Times, I'm just deliberately picking it. It says, while coronavirus spread in the US, an Indian slum with 1 million residents contained it. How did the magic happen? The magic happened because there were simple, simple basics. Testing, tracing, and isolation. I repeat, testing, tracing, and isolation. And that is what now many countries are realizing, that you have to live with this virus. And therefore, how do you test? How do you trace and track? And then how do you do local isolation? That is how it is basically going to work. So there was a big lesson from that. But the most important part was this. You know, in fact, even World Bank, World Health Organization, praised the efforts. And uh, those people who manage it are getting interviewed all over the world today, how you did that miracle. So I think the most important part is that there were several entities that partnered with BMC. BMC is Bombay Municipal Corporation. Okay. And gave their expertise on a pro bono basis. For example, if you see, uh, for uh, uh, we use artificial intelligence driven deep dive analysis and projections and all these companies actually helped us. Then there was AI based screenings, by the way. 
and i will talk more about qr.ai a little later then information management dashboards which the mckinsey and company ernst and why a uh, young uh, pwc etc help then location based insights were provided then key technological solutions were provided etc and the information on platforms and so on so it was an effort where everybody came together to basically help in fact it becomes a brilliant case study by the way how this miracle was actually done so let me take this uh, uh, cure.ai that again by the way i'm very proud to say it was a startup so what it does is that it detects covid-19 lung infections in less than 1 minute and less than 2 dollars by the way incredible okay and they actually were responsible for doing uh, the uh, sort of uh, rapid analysis so what they did was they helped in triaging the high risk patients so there was a bus actually uh, which conducted the mass screening it was equipped with cures ai and other testing facility then the close contacts of positive patients were screened then the decision criteria x-ray report fever and oxygen saturation levels and then there was the intervention in terms of hospitalization quarantine etc or discharging decisions etc so you can see how this technology was brought to bear in avoiding uh, as uh, los angeles times said 1 million people uh, you know out of that uh, disaster and i'm very proud to say this cure.ai is going global now for example italy's san rafael hotel hospital is using it uh, bolton national health uh, uh, nhs foundation trust is using it uh, then um, uh, you know uh, this uh, bbc has covered it with great news uh, uh, and similarly the government of oman is actually using it so the technology that was developed uh, in india under these emergent conditions is now just flying so these are two challenges now the third challenge was limited icu beds and skilled caregivers you can just imagine when there is a exponential uh, growth like that um, uh, uh, you know what can uh, basically um, uh, happen and therefore no beds no skills and can you just imagine this dozy again a startup by the way he created something which is a continuous contact free uh, vital uh, monitor with monitoring uh, uh, capability so you just place it under the mattress that iot and it absorbs microwave vibrations produced by heart respiration body movements and converts it into biomarkers just place under the mattress connect to wifi and then you sleep actually so it has the capacity to converting any bed into a step down icu in less than 2 minutes it is 20 times cheaper than products used in icu there is no maintenance consumables prior technical expertise required for usage and therefore this is as simple as that and of course spo2 you have to actually have a device uh, to uh, sort of uh, connect it and the rest of it you connect to the uh, internet and you get data so when in emergency when you can't just have hospitals you can have a uh, care at home with high risk patients elders home isolation of covid patients uh, can be done and ward monitoring can be done and so on and so forth so therefore it is almost like track your vitals while you sleep all right including all these vitals that you basically talk about now this is turning out to have bigger repercussions post covid because it will have repercussions in terms of being able to monitor as you sleep uh, or as you uh, you know lie down uh, and you can quite clearly see what parallel systems it can basically uh, 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 create Uh, with a disruptive innovation then uh, the other issue that came up was that all right i mean uh, 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 you know like my driver had a uh, 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 was tested positive he went to the hospital and he got his uh, reports based on rt pcr after a couple of days etc we don't have that sort of a time ideally is a pregnancy test you know just a paper sweep and you get to know basically how now i'm very proud to say that's what india did you know as i said i headed the, this uh, uh, csir council of scientific industrial research which had 40 laboratories you know like national chemical laboratory national aeronautical laboratory and we have 11 biology laboratories and one of them is this igib institute of genomics and integrative biology okay so they and as you all must have known this year uh, the award uh, nobel prize award uh, prize actually was won by crispr 
CRISPR is like molecular scissors, you know, where you cut and uh, stick uh, sort of uh, uh, DNA base. So they use that technology, Cas9, and use paper strip chemistry to create something where just for $7 per test, within one hour, you get to know what, uh, uh, whether you have it or not. Uh, with the sensitivity and selectivity, uh, which is more than 98%. And it identifies single base pair differences with Pico Miller sensitivity. It is so sensitive. And I'm very proud to say Tata Sons joined them. And Tata Sons are not only going to produce it for India, but for the whole world, by the way. They are looking at uh, US markets also, getting US FDA approval, and so on and so forth. And this is exactly the kind of uh, uh, innovation we wanted. So when you get a pandemic, you want actionable science, which is rapidly deployable. And that is what these scientists were able to do. That's the uh, point I want to see. And you can quite clearly see uh, basically the, how the paper strip works actually. In fact, if you are positive, you get these two lines. Otherwise, you get a, a single line. It is as simple as that. What was the next challenge? It was India is a poor country. And therefore, it has to be low cost. But when you do something and you are playing with the life it has to be high performance. It cannot be low performance. Okay, it cannot be low cost, low performance. Ventilators, and that too under Indian conditions. And how do you do that? So I'm very proud to say here, the private sector came in. You know, the beauty was everybody came in. So there is this uh, Marico company, uh, you know, which had created Marico Innovation Foundation in uh, uh, 2003. And I happened to be its chairman, the Marico Innovation Foundation. It was one of the earliest. So they said, we'll challenge uh, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the intellectual might of uh, the entire country and uh, give them grand challenges. Okay. And uh, it was 0.4 million dollar, 2.5 crore in Indian uh, currency uh, rupees. And I was the chairman of the selection committee. It is incredible the kind of response we got. And we looked at uh, personal protection equipment. We looked at ventilators because we're desperately short of them in, 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 in May. You can't just imagine. Within 21 days, we had 1,500 applications uh, or eight, uh, uh, intents, which was skittled down to 600. And finally, we came to six and give awards to six. That does not mean those many ventilators were built. Everyone, everybody wanted to jump in and say, we'll do it. So, this innovate to beat COVID was the grand challenge that we gave. And as I said, India needed not just innovation, but extremely affordable innovation. This is a new word, Indian innovation, which works under Indian conditions. And what are the Indian conditions? You don't have compressed medical air, which is there in all hospitals. You have frequent power cuts. In villages, there is no power. And if you have, uh, there are frequent power cuts, like Bombay saw one big power cut uh, uh, power shutdown recently. There is a limited trained technical staff. So how do you deal with this and still create uh, sort of high technology? And it is incredible, you know, this uh, uh, no, no car, for, uh, for example, created an ICU ventilator. The good story about this is that this was an IIT Kanpur uh, startup. And they were not in this area at all. They were doing robotics. But as soon as this came, say, we'll come and uh, do sort of uh, ventilators. And they created one which meets these conditions. Shriya's came uh, with a ventilator with automatic uh, ventilation uh, that you don't require actually skilled workers. KPIT Technologies, which is right here in Pune, I've been the chairman of their innovation council. There is software. But as a social responsibility, they created a lightweight uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, b b b you know, amazing uh, sort of ventilator. And can you just imagine they have received an export order. Now. So for a country which was importing actually ventilators uh, uh, within 100 days to 120 days, uh, uh, they have been able to come out and sort of do things uh, which um, uh, appears incredible. That applicability is right from ambulance to ICUs. There is a range and at a fraction of the cost. What are the challenge six? How to meet an exponential rise in personal protection equipment demand. And you can quite clearly see, I like the exponentials, by the way. I, do, I like uh, uh, curves of this particular kind. And you can see in March, we were hardly producing any PPEs. And from March 
to May, uh, the kind of rise that you see. And because we are importing 50,000 uh, uh, PP kits uh, every year from China, and from there, we sort of moved on, and in 60 days, uh, the, uh, uh, the PP industry in India grew 56x. Uh, and I'm very proud to say that India transitioned from importing to an exporting country in, in such a, uh, a small time. And exported 2.3 million kits in July 2020 uh, itself. This is something very uh, re uh, remarkable. Uh, Channel 7 was, of course, no vaccines. Nobody in the world had. And we also started working at the rest of the world. But there is something when it comes to vaccines, there is something I want to proudly mention to you about India. That it has been a global leader in vaccines production, by the way. Now, if you see the global capacity, you know, if you look at India, then US, EU developed markets all together, China and others, you will see India is here in terms of doses, $2.3 billion, uh, a billion doses. So 40% of uh, share. So we produce uh, vaccines and 70% of India's capacity is used for exports. And right here in Pune city, uh, Serum Institute is the largest player. And I'm very proud to say that two out of three children, uh, uh, you know, which are born globally, they receive a vaccine manufactured by Serum. So they started getting ready for repurposing the existing capacity and building capacity for new vaccine uh, development because they had all the uh, very though. So, so far, there have been 13 vaccine, and 30 vaccine candidates uh, um, in line, but three of them are at a very advanced uh, uh, stage. Uh, for example, uh, the first one is Bharat Biotech and National Institute of Virology. It is based on uh, Wolverion inactivated vaccine, and this is in phase three now. Uh, the Zyko D vaccine, Zydus, Cadilla Healthcare, that is plasmid DNA vaccine. And the third one is, of course, we are doing it in partnership uh, with Oxford University and AstraZeneca. It's a non-replicating viral vector uh, based on chimp uh, uh, adenovirus, and that's in phase three. So we are in phase three, in phase two, and uh, phase uh, uh, three, and hopefully within the next few months, uh, uh, we should have uh, uh, the vaccine out. But most importantly, we are using different strategies. Here it is inactivated vaccine. Here it is plasmid DNA vaccine. And here it is a replicating, uh, uh, non-replicating viral vector. Now, uh, these are the headlines from Bloomberg. They say the world's best hope for enough food vaccine comes from uh, India and the Serum Institute. So as I said, world largest manufacturer is exposed to 140 countries. It is expanding its capacity now and 1.9 billion doses capacity by 2020 is what is their target. Now, India is known as the pharmacy of the world. And I must say that in terms of supplying uh, low cost, but high quality therapeutics, uh, you know, if you just uh, look at our export share, uh, US 30%, Africa 19%, EU 16%, uh, uh, you know, so we specialize uh, in this. And you can see when uh, the supply of hydroxychloroquine came up, actually we supplied on a commercial basis uh, and out of which 32 were humanitarian aids uh, to something like uh, 50 the countries. And uh, I must say, uh, there were headlines, hydroxychloroquine, uh, 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 President Trump was kind enough to say that uh, to our prime minister that uh, India is not just uh, uh, helping not just India, but the humanity. Uh, Israel Prime Minister said, uh, thank India for de delivering hydroxychloroquine uh, and so on and so forth. So we became the quick suppliers of this uh, critical. The beauty, once again, is creating low cost, high quality. So our Indian Institute of Chemical Technology work, this is uh, CSIR, once again, same organization to which I belong, actually, uh, they again looked at locally available chemicals, repurposed the generic drug, and Cipla is a company which is now actually producing. You might recollect Cipla in a different context, by the way. When HIV AIDS uh, had hit, and uh, it was $10,000 uh, uh, for a, a treatment for an year, uh, if you remember, the same Indian Institute of Chemical Technology created it, and Cipla produces for $300, from $10,000 to $300. 
you know and that was a history as you know the they had doha declaration where intellectual property rights and uh, uh, rights of the poor came together the public health came together so it's the same history in a way that is getting repeated now because as i uh, as i showed you it is just dollar one and then of course there are a lot of clinical trials for repurposed drugs that csr is doing these are the drugs uh, these are the modes of action these are the industrial partners and this is the current status basically i won't have time to get into uh, the detail because i have some 20 minutes more uh, 45 minutes i am supposed to speak and then uh, uh, take the q and a so i'll not get into details but the sense i want to give you is that uh, india is in action india is working uh the interesting change that has taken place is uh, the prime minister has announced what is called as atmanirbhar bharat that means self reliant india now why uh, as soon as you say self reliant india one will get worried oh does it mean that you are going to uh, lock down your doors and windows and close and uh, 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 just go for import substitution no innovation etc like pre liberalization no i want to emphasize the idea of india is not about uh, self reliant is not about a return to import substitution or isolationism but an active participation in global supply chains now i know that there is a talk on global supply chains a little later and that's an extremely important uh, 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 talk now because uh, the global supply chains have been uh, uh, sort of uh, disrupted hugely uh especially when the whole world was dependent upon china so what the world is looking at is not china less they can't go suddenly china less but they are saying less china and then less and less china these are the strategies all around the world so we have to also uh, protect ourselves uh, from dangers of breakdown of supply chains all right while we build the self reliant india so i will just take uh, this pharmacy of the world that's the good news but the bad news is that we are over dependent upon the chinese imports 63% of india's pharmaceutical imports are api and intermediates and almost 70% of so basically we are hugely dependent now we can't say tomorrow on were china less because we don't have that so we have to start reducing our dependence so what we have done is that we have identified api means by the way uh, active pharmaceutical ingredient which goes into making of the final uh, formulation so all of these we are vulnerable so for all of these now we have created schemes because remember whenever such a thing happens policy comes in government policy comes in so government has uh, sprung into action they have created incentives of around a billion dollar they identify 41 eligible products you know which covers 53 apis uh, for 6 years and uh, then there are incentives that have been given uh, in terms of tax and other things you know if they are fermentation they are chemically surveyed who are eligible uh, what is the tenure of the scheme immediately within uh, uh, sort of couple of weeks the government came out with this uh, for burgdrag park scheme has been created with huge incentives uh, given and because they will have common facilities such as solvent recovery plan distillation plan power steam units common effluent treatment etc because don't forget that uh, apis we were also producing in india why did we stop because they were polluting basically and we found that uh, china were willingly doing it and they were supplying at 20 30% less cost basically that's why we started doing it so when we get into new process chemistry it has to be green process chemistry it cannot just be polluting chemistry at all so that is where and india's biggest advantage is its strength in process chemistry and process engineering so there is a huge effort that is going on on on, on this uh, at the moment i would say 3d's uh, are driving our future the first is digitalization second is decentralization and third is decarbonization now you can see the whole world has gone digital work from home would not have been possible if we did not uh, digitalize ourselves when i say 1.6 billion children went out of the school they would not have been able to study from home if they did not have and so on. but it also led to decentralization because everything started happening in home home assumed a different but also decarbonization you must have seen actually no vehicles on the road and 
Therefore, uh, the you know air got suddenly clean, and now that the activity has started, once again we are going to grey skies from those blue skies. So there are lessons to be learned. Now you can see that digitalization will create decentralization. Like for example, three D printing. What you are doing is uh, printing a part in your perhaps your garage. You are not producing it in a big assembly line in a big plant and then transporting it, thereby creating a carbon footprint. So this is actually driving our future. And therefore that work from home, I saw uh, the CEO of uh, Google saying on the other day uh, that uh, till uh, in July, that till next July, they will all work from home. This KPIT technology that I talked about, he said 50% of my people will work from home. And he says, why? Because I run hundreds of buses. They create carbon footprint. And uh, each person, there are close to three hours are wasted. Why should I do that? So it's going to be a very different uh, world. Now, digitalization has hit a fast forward button. For example, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella said, we have seen two years worth of digital transformation in just two months. Uh, telemedicine arrives in UK, an expert said, 10 years of change in one week, because you don't go to the doctor, then what do you do? But I must say, this is happening in the rest of the world, but there is a silent revolution that is taking place in India. For example, can you believe it? 50 million Indians use telehealth between March and May. 80% of them were first time users. India becomes home to the second highest number of eight tech companies after US, basically, suddenly in that country. And you look at the global leader in real time financial transactions, now 41 million transactions uh, per day, just taken a year ago and sort of what has happened. And this is a digital transformation. Yeah, I am on the board of directors of Reliance, which is the most valuable company in India. And we had to hold the annual general meeting uh, sort of virtually this year. And we are expecting uh, uh, something like uh, five to 10,000 people. Can you just believe it? 0.2 million uh, people from across 42 countries. This is probably one of the largest shareholder meetings in the world. We are trying to find out if, whether it was largest or not. But I can at this point in time, say this, this was entirely possible because India was digital. Data. And if you can see the FinTech, I heard about uh, the FinTech province of, uh, of uh, Atlanta, uh, the, the enterprise segment, for example, Sunday during the COVID time, uh, three FinTech companies uh, have become um, uh, unicorns like uh, Razorpay, you know, it helps business modernize their financial infrastructure, provides intelligent automated payment, Pine Labs, uh, POS and merchant commerce solution providers, uh, Zeroda, uh, it becomes uh, India's number one stockbroker, added 0.2 million customers uh, every month. And also the retail uh, segments, for example, Paytm and so on and uh, so forth. Now, all these digital transformation, you would say, come on, I mean, we didn't know that. Um, um, how did that all happen? So I'd like to end on a personal uh, uh, note, basically. Reliance uh, is uh, a great company and I've been associated uh, with it as a member of the board, but I also chair the Reliance Innovation Council. And the individual that you see here is uh, Mukesh Amban. You know, uh, he was rated in Times uh, uh, Top 100 and uh, uh, as the greatest uh, uh, CEO, etc. So many things he has got. But during the COVID time, by the way, he rose to the fourth richest man in the world, by the way, it is yeah, sort of incredible. And there is an interesting story around it. So as uh, it says, uh, he believes, uh, we believe in growth is life. And then innovation as a way of life, you put the two together, innovation led growth. Only thing is that he believes in disruption, innovation led growth and disruption, innovation led exponential growth. All right, so that is the motto. And uh, we have a terrific innovation council, by the way, couple of Nobel laureates, George Whitesides, uh, I mean, people of uh, uh, that kind. Now, he and I were having a discussion. And once uh, he said, Doc, uh, let's leapfrog uh, to something like this. I said, let's discuss it. Why does the frog leap? Because he's afraid of the predators. All right. And he jumps a few feet. We should not do that. All right. Because we are afraid of the competitors. We jump a few feet. We should pull what? The size of the pole determines the size of your aspiration, basically. And that is where this book actually came about, leapfrogging to pole vaulting. And I will tell you sort of more about it. 
And then uh, this book, by the way, uh, which came out, Ratan Tata, one of our most respected industrialists, he has said this captivating book through its impressive assured innovation framework shows the way forward. And uh, I'm very happy to say that this book won the business book of the year award, leapfrogging to pole vaulting last year. Not bad for a scientist to write best business book of uh, uh, the year. Now, this is the pole vaulting that I'm talking about. If you just see, India was 155th in mobile data transmission. And within no time, they jumped to the first place, as you can see here. The pole vaulting to reach uh, 50 million users, for example. You know, for 50 million users, telephone took 50 years, mobile took 12 years, YouTube took four years, Facebook three years, Twitter took two years, Reliance did it in 83 days. And there was a lot of innovation that was involved in this, by the way, in order to sort of uh, 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 do that. I won't have time to actually uh, tell you, but now these books have to be rewritten. Similarly, as I said, 155th to the first position. If you see before Jio came in and after Jio, 4G Voltage phone was $300. We brought it down to $23 and effectively $0 because we said, give us 1500 rupees, we'll return it to you after three uh, uh, years. Data per GB cost, it was $5. We brought it down to 0 0.05. All right, it is the cheapest in the world. And voice expenditure was $1.6. Uh, per minute, we brought it down to zero. All right. Now, this is the transformation. So, what has happened? This pole vault, RIL has jumped 47 places in three months because on September 10, 2020, RIL's capitalization reached $210 billion. And this became the first Indian company to cost $200 billion. And this is now Reliance's 40th most valuable firm ahead of ExxonMobil, PepsiCo. SAP, Oracle, Pfizer, and Novartis. That is pole vaulting. And you can see the platformization. See, you know, the top global companies by market cap, if you just see, 2009 to 2019, in a decade, it was Petro China, ExxonMobil, ICBC China, BHP Britain, Walmart, etc., etc., etc. Now, if you see in 2019, it is Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet. Entire picture has changed. And this is the magic of uh, sort of uh, 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 the platformization. So this is where Geo created its own platform, as you can see, in terms of connectivity, business platforms, consumer platforms, in all these areas, okay? And a new company called Geo Platform was created. And you can see now, we talk about uh, the investment from US into India and from India into US. You can see all these companies and majority of them as you can see, our investors uh, from the US, they have uh, invested. And can you just imagine 15 uh, billion dollars were invested uh, in just those 100 days of uh, COVID, all right, when the rest of the world was happening. So this was something absolutely remarkable. So as I said, uh, it became the 40th most valuable. And these are the platforms, by the way, that has been created uh, on which uh, we are able to now uh, pole vault. Now, the important point is that, as you must have seen, there is a discussion now on 5G. UI, most uh, countries do not want to deal with them, and we have to create our own. And I'm very proud to say that uh, Reliance has created its own technology, end-to-end -end suite of 5G technologies, which is made in India, covers radio network and core network, complete ownership of both software and hardware on Geo platform, carrying in hyperscale products for large deployment, IP multimedia subsystem components, and field times are just getting ready. So this is the great picture about Geo 5G, uh, you know. Now, the basic point is pole vaulting is fine, but when you are pole vaulting, and this is my last uh, three, four minutes, I'll finish. Uh, when we are pole vaulting, uh, how do you make sure you don't break your bones? And therefore, uh, this book, uh, you will see that in chapter three, we have shown in pole vaulting, how do you not break your bone? And therefore, how do you assure success? We are given an assured innovation framework. It has to be affordable, scalable, sustainable, universal, that means user-friendly, rapid, and excellent. These are the five criteria, okay? And we have done analysis of companies which have survived. If you look at Fortune 50 or Fortune 500, the least 10 years ago and 50 years ago and today is very different. 
and, and distinctive course. So we have seen now, for example, if you look at Jio, is it affordable? Yes. Scalable? Yes. 400 million customers by the way, within no time. Sustainable? Yes. It is making profit. Is it universal? Yes. This lady can use it and this lady also can use it. Is it rapid? I just show you, showed to you in 83 days uh, what we did. Is it excellence? Yes. 4G LT, the latest technology. Is it distinctive? Yes. In every possible uh, way. So I want to just end by saying that since I'm talking about COVID and post COVID what we require, we require resilience. And if you just do the Google search that during COVID, which is the word or which is the phrase which has seen the highest rise, you will find resilience. And each company is now trying to see how do we become sort of resilient. So I, I gave a talk uh, recently on resilience and proposed 10 tenets. Adaptability is one. Agility is second. Resilient thinking is third. Scenario-based planning. It has to be building a purpose-driven organization so that everybody gets aligned. Platformization, and I just showed to you the effect. It has to be digital ready. If you're not digital ready, you're not ready for your future. Fostering self-disruption, basically, uh, is, is extremely important, continuously reinventing, displacing your own products yourself, otherwise the competitor will do it for you. Then the climate consciousness, you know, is extraordinarily important. And finally, autonomous uh, innovation, these two, uh, uh, three, uh, these three are required and they all fit in to the assured framework, by the way. And we have just uh, in the chapter three, you'll find, for example, companies like they will all get success at a point in time. But how? Because they failed the assured framework. You know, they were affordable, scalable, not sustainable, and so on and so forth. Just to take one example, like Napster, free download of music. All right. And they had uh, uh, 600 million uh, uh, users. So scale was there, affordability was there because it was free. You, you can't have anything uh, the, the, the sort of more affordable than free. But they don't exist. Why? They were not sustainable. Why? Because in sustainability, there is the issue of being sustainable environmentally, economically, as well as from a societal perspective. And the Society of Musicians said, you can't download my music free. And they were out. So in our book, you will find that all these companies, including BlackBerry, we have done an analysis of these, all right, and shown. So therefore, when we build businesses which are resilient, try to use this assured sort of matrix. And I must say that it has become extremely popular uh, now uh, in terms of uh, business evaluations, startup evaluations, investments, and so on and so forth. But I wanted to end my lecture by saying not only what Indian science, technology, innovation has done, but ending it up with something that uh, now we are almost at the end of the uh, pandemic and we are just uh, uh, wondering when the end is going to come. It is still an unknown, unknown, how we are going to sort of recur, etc. You know, people call me a dangerous optimist, by the way. So I have optimism and that optimism comes. Finally, I like to end by saying by my belief in the human spirit. It's incredible. You know, when the pandemic hit our uh, migrant labor, for example, you know, they traveled hundreds of kilometers going back to their villages and so on. And I've seen a girl, just 15 year old, driving her father on a bicycle, taking her father on a bicycle for 200 kilometers in eight days, all right? That is resilience. That is human spirit, basically. So I'd like to end on a positive note by talking about uh, the example of uh, this gentleman, Newton, you know? And this showed resilience despite pandemic. So England saw its last uh, major outbreak of bubonic plague in 65, 66. And as a precautionary measure, the students at Cambridge University, including young Newton, were sent home till the following year, as has happened uh, sort of uh, this time. Nothing different in that pandemic and this pandemic. But what did he do? He spent his enforced vacation working on ideas underlying his spectacular accomplishments, which are fundamental to natural sciences. First, gravitation. Second, laws of motion. Third, calculus. And fourth, optics. Can you just imagine all that happened during the pandemic time? All right. So uh, there, there is a uh, sort of uh, somebody has written an epitaph. It says, nature and nature's laws lay hidden night 
God said, let Newton be and all was light. I think each one of us can bring that light post-pandemic. That is my biggest uh, uh, optimism. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Professor Marshall Carr, for a very inspiring and challenging presentation. Uh, and also for the uh, models and templates you have built in your book and your presentation to guide us into uh, the kind of innovation that has an impact on uh, a large swath of population. 